Good evening and welcome to NTD News. I'm Stephanie Cox. Here are today's top stories. The country awaits the jury's verdict for defendant Kyle Rittenhouse. On the ground, the city and state brace for potential violence following the con verdict. Parents gather in the nation's capital, demanding their right to a voice in their children's education. Some tell us that schools are helping students change their gender identities without their parents' knowledge. Department of Homeland Security Secretary Mayorkas testifies before a Senate committee. He fielded questions about possible threats to national security, with some of his answers leading to heated exchanges. President Biden and Chinese Communist Party leader Xi Jinping meet face-to-face -face by video call. It's a time of particularly high tension between the two nations. And there's going to be a showdown between the NFL and the NBA. Two former players are set to fight each other in the boxing ring. The Kyle Rittenhouse trial has entered its final phase. Jurors are now deliberating the verdict. Meanwhile, outside the courthouse, the city and state prepare for the violence that might follow the jury's decision. NTD's Miguel Moreno has that story. At a Kenosha courthouse, Kyle Rittenhouse pulls six slips out of a raffle drum. <laughs> Those slips identified jurors who were then excluded from the deliberation process. The 12 jurors who remain will craft the verdict. A jury can spend minutes, hours, days, even weeks before convicting or acquitting a defendant. Outside the courtroom, the city and state prepare for violence that might arise following the verdict. Wisconsin Governor Tony Evers has activated National Guard's members ready to help Kenosha law enforcement if they need to. And the Kenosha Police Department has said they're monitoring the trial, preparing for the verdict. Well, I, I think what, the, what they're laying out is that we're not going to uh, stand for any, any violence. Public safety advisor Jim Fuda tells me it's better that the city be overprepared than underprepared. I mean, you saw what happened in the Capitol riots on January 6th when, when uh, uh, other agencies couldn't come to help. They weren't, they weren't staged. Uh, uh, the uh, National Guard wasn't, wasn't prepared. They were hours out. Which, so you can see how t uh, timeliness is extremely important when, uh, uh, basically when things go to hell like that. On social media, Marvel Comics writer Dylan Park responded to the governor's activation of the National Guard to help the city. Park said, burn the m -er to the ground. He has since deleted that tweet, but Park claims he's now receiving death threats. But I just wish that... Calling for peace, business owner Kenny Harper took the stand outside of the courtroom. We, we've had enough. Yeah. We, we've done enough. There has been enough. There's been enough sadness. There's been enough, enough pain. It is time for healing. It is time for us to recover and us to rebuild and show the world that Kenosha is a beautiful place. There is peace in our problems. Yes. So no matter what happens, no matter uh, what the issue is, if you agree, disagree, please just do it peacefully. Yes, we're gonna grow as a city. Others there demand that people, quote, shut down the city if Rittenhouse is acquitted. Miguel Moreno, NTD News. Parents stood alongside several members of Congress in Washington, D.C. today. They're demanding parental rights in their children's education. Many of them say they see a weakening of the family unit, and they're calling on parents across the nation to work hard to strengthen the sacred bond between parent and child. NTD's Melina Weiskopf spoke with some of the parents and Congress members at the rally. I'm here right outside of the Congress building where parents from different states and cities across the nation have gathered to send a message to the government and public school systems across the nation. That message is to stop pushing for ideological transformation in the classrooms. Some parents even telling us that schools are going so far as to help students change their gender identity, but without the parents knowing about it. This policy says that public school can assist in the gender transition of your child without your consent. Gender transition program, six pages, uh, deciding uh, which bathrooms to use, which pronouns to use when they would go on school field trips, whether to room with boys or girls, um, and the parents uh, had no idea. It's a, a new and dangerous way of thinking to think that the child should be taken from the from the safety and the protection of the of the parent and raised by the state instead 
And with Congress right now working to pass a social welfare bill to fund universal pre-K, some are concerned these big government bucks will just ram these policies through government-run pre-K centers. Child care costs are expensive, preschool's expensive, um, some extra support sounds great, but parents should be warned. Um, if the government becomes, if the federal government becomes the primary funder of child care and preschool, it will have be, be in control of what happens in child care and, um, and preschool. Some conservative members of Congress say the government should be looking not at more funding, but less. I'm all about cutting the funding. For God's sakes, the only thing that I've learned in my short 10 months up here in D.C. is follow the money, and if you pull the strings and you stop that appropriation, that gets their attention. And that's the way I look at things. So I think in Congress, I think focus on, focusing on removing a lot of these wealthy influences into the school district, a lot of money that often goes, for example, Merrick Garland's son-in-law. A lot of that money goes uh, to his publishing company that's selling critical race theory to these schools. Representative Tinney echoed the message of these other parents. The current government and school systems are driving a wedge between parents and their kids. This thing that I did, apparently it has struck a blow against the communists, because that's who the real enemy is. That's who we are fighting against. Never forget who we are fighting against. This effort of indoctrination and sexualization of your children and the grooming of your kids, it is being done by the communists. And don't let this moment stop here. Keep going, keep fighting, because God is on our side. Continuing the push to restore parental rights and to protect the sacred parent-child bond. Reporting in Washington, D.C., Melina Weiskup, NTD News. And in the early hours of the morning, a school board in Northern Virginia reversed its decision to remove sexually explicit books from school libraries. This after hours of heated public discussion Monday night. According to local media, dozens of parents, students, and librarians spoke against removing the books, some calling it unconstitutional. The Spotsylvania County School Board decided last week to remove all sexually explicit books after parent complaints. However, the decision was purportedly made without defining what counted as sexually explicit content. According to a board member, the school board attorney said their decision to remove the books was unconstitutional. Speakers on Monday night expressed outrage over comments made by two school board members. They had remarked last week that some sexually explicit books should be burned. These two members voted against rescinding the book ban. And the issue of sexually explicit books in public schools is a nationwide phenomenon. Parents across the country are finding such books and demanding their removal and even legal action. NTD's Grace Coulter speaks with a parent and a child advocate on the issue. No porn in our schools. Parents nationwide are discovering sexually explicit content in their children's school libraries. Some of it, they say, even amounts to pornography. Outraged and horrified, they're taking action. A child is a child. And if you see this acceptable, you belong on a national registry and not a school board. Parents in Fort Mill, South Carolina, recently sent examples of pornographic materials found in schools to Governor Henry McMaster. Among them, the book Genderqueer, a memoir. This book contains illustrations of sex acts, including between an adult male and a minor. The governor found it so explicit, he requested an investigation last Wednesday. This is to find out how the book was allowed into schools and whether any state laws have been broken. Texas Governor Greg Abbott is also taking action, and numerous school districts across the country are removing and reviewing such books. Mother of six Stacy Langton found genderqueer and a book called Lawn Boy in her Fairfax County School District. Lawn Boy describes sex acts between a fourth grade boy and another male minor. She brought the books to the attention of her school board. The reason why I spoke out is because I am a Christian and I have a duty before God. I cannot uh, look at something that is objectively evil and stay silent. So I felt that if I didn't know, I would imagine most parents don't know. After Langdon spoke out, the books were removed for review. 
A number of LGBTQ activists have defended the books and called parents trying to remove them homophobic and transphobic. The author of Genderqueer wrote in the Washington Post that the book is important for queer youth. But Langton, like many parents, says this is besides the point. I didn't care about the gender of the people depicted in the acts. I didn't care about the sexual orientation of the people depicted in the acts. It is about the fact that the acts depicted are pornography and pedophilia. And that is wrong objectively and that has to stop. Child advocate Yako Boyens, who helps to rescue and rehabilitate victims of sex trafficking, says these types of books, along with the content of some sex ed curricula, make children more vulnerable to sexual exploitation. So what do you think the pedophiles in our nation are saying today? And we just was, we were part of Operation, just 18 pedophiles arrested over the week of Halloween in one county, okay, in, the, in one county. What do you think the pedophiles are saying? They're saying, thank you. Thank you for grooming the kid in the classroom. Thank you for introducing anal sex to the 10-year-old in the classroom that now when I approach him with this topic on Instagram, on TikTok, the child doesn't have a radar that's up. The flag is not raised. This is normal. Oh, we talk about this in the classroom. Here's just another adult that wants to have a conversation with me. And so it goes. So it is destructive at a level we can't measure. Some parents are calling for legal action to be taken against their school boards for allowing such books, since they say obscenity laws have been violated. But Boyan says there's a loophole in obscenity law. He points out that a 1973 California court decision can allow for such books to be in public schools. All school districts have to do is claim that the material has serious literary value. Unless we call out the mechanisms they use and how they operate, you can't stop it. You're always late. You're always behind. we got to get ahead of it. The obscenity exemption statute has to be revised. We have to close the loopholes. We have to demand, every parent demand that the school show you the curriculum, the full curriculum. They have to, on the premises, show the full curriculum. But parents have not for decades even asked, what's my child being taught at school? But that's all changed over the last several months. Parents nationwide aren't only asking, they're demanding answers and change. Grace Coulter, NTD News. The latest figures on immigrants illegally crossing the southern border are out. In October, border agents encountered over 160,000 illegal immigrants, most of them single adults. NTD's Allison Lee breaks down the numbers. In October, Customs and Border Protection, or CBP, encountered over 164,000 illegal border crossers. That's the highest recorded number for the month of October. The figure is also slightly higher than preliminary estimates and 55% higher than the previous high for the month of October. Two-thirds of illegal immigrants, or over 108,000 of them, are single adults. Only 26% came in family units, and unaccompanied minors made up almost 8%. There's a large jump in illegal immigrants who have been ejected from the country before, now trying to enter the U.S. again. About 30 percent of the encounters were with immigrants who had illegally crossed the border at least once in the previous 12 months. Of those encountered, authorities expelled over half under Title 42. This is a pandemic measure that makes it easier to kick out immigrants over concerns that they may spread the CCP virus. But the numbers didn't include illegal immigrants who evaded agents. According to internal data obtained by the Epoch Times, that number was estimated to be around 50,000. Compared to September, the number of encounters dropped by close to 22 percent. The Biden administration is highlighting this decrease. Acting CBP Commissioner Troy Miller said, October marks the third straight month of declining unauthorized migrant encounters along the southwest border, with particularly sharp drops in families and unaccompanied children. Allison Lee, NTD News. Department of Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas was in the hot seat today. Members of the Senate Judiciary Committee asked him tough questions about the nation's security, focusing primarily on the crisis at the southern border. NTD's Jason Perry has the story. Round with three minutes each. Secretary Mayorkas, if you please stand. Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas was sworn in before he testified before the Senate Judiciary Committee. And during his opening statement, he said the most significant and persistent threat to America is homegrown domestic terrorism. 
Senator Josh Howley was concerned because not all of the refugees who recently entered the U.S. from Afghanistan had in-person interviews. We capture their biographic and biometric information. We screen That's them. like a fingerprint. We, uh, a, a fingerprint, uh, a photograph, biographic information, and we run it against our databases in our law enforcement intelligence and other uh, holdings. But you're not interviewing them, Mr. Secretary. It's not unless the, they're already in our database that you then bother to interview them. Howley said it was not enough to give in-depth interviews only to refugees who were already in U.S. databases. Do you know how many of the 9-11 hijackers, the 20 who tried to enter this country, do you know how many of them were given an in-depth interview by a trained Senator, official? If I may walk through the, the process. No, no, this is an important question. Do you know how many of the hijackers were given an in-depth interview? I do not. One. The answer is one. That person did not enter the country. The others were not given an interview. We know the outcome. Senator Ted Cruz disagreed with Mayorkas over how many illegal immigrants actually show up for their asylum hearings. To you, because so if your testimony to the great majority show up for hearing is wrong and false testimony, you will com uh, correct it in writing. Let me ask you subsequently. Oh, if, um, no, let me, let me, let me. You, you won't correct it in writing? No, no, I most certainly will, but I need to say something, Senator. And that is that I take my oath Fine, you take your oath seriously. My, my time is limited on that. Senator John Cornyn mentioned the children who enter the country without parents or guardians. He said about 56,000 unaccompanied minors have crossed the border since Biden became president, and at least 10,000 are now unaccounted for. Frankly, the Biden administration doesn't know whether they're being forced into labor, being trafficked for sex, being uh, abused or neglected. Mayorkas agreed to provide a plan in writing to show how the Department of Homeland Security would respond if a large number of Border Patrol agents resigned due to vaccine mandates. Jason Perry, NTD News. A significant conversation between the U.S. and China without significant results. President Biden and Chinese Communist Party leader Xi Jinping met for about three and a half hours in a video call. Both sides said they see basic communication as key to avoiding a major crisis, but the talk offered no breakthroughs. Good evening to everyone here in the United States and good morning to you, Mr. President in Beijing. In the latest and most anticipated virtual summit, U.S. President Joe Biden and Communist China's leader Xi Jinping sought a reset in relations on Monday. Both stressed open communication and friendly competition as they sat for hours of virtual talks. The virtual summit was aimed at relieving tensions between Beijing and Washington. Their relationship soured over trade negotiations, Beijing's expanding nuclear arsenal, and Taiwan. All topics covered in this meeting. Also addressed in the discussion were North Korea, Afghanistan, Iran, global energy markets, the climate, and the pandemic. It seems to me we need to establish some common sense guardrails to be clear and honest where we disagree and work together where interests intersect, especially on vital global issues like climate change. Calling Biden an old friend. I am very happy to see my old friend. She stressed the need for mutual respect. And Biden emphasized the importance of working together on global issues like climate change. As I've said before, it seems to me our responsibility as leaders of China and the United States is to ensure that the competition between our countries does not veer into conflict, whether intended or unintended. Just simple, straightforward competition. The White House said Biden also raised concerns over Beijing's practices in Xinjiang, Tibet, and Hong Kong, as well as its overall record on human rights. Prior to Monday's meeting, she and Biden had outlined competing global visions. Biden has called for a free and open Indo-Pacific, seen as pushback against what many see as China's coercion in the region. And she has said the region must not return to the tensions of the Cold War era. The contentious issue of whether the U.S. will send White House envoys to the Beijing Winter Olympics in February did not come up. But they did reach a consensus on journalist visas. Chinese state media China Daily reported on Tuesday, China and the U.S. will ease restrictions on access for journalists from each other's countries. 
The Trump administration had imposed 90-day work visa limits on all Chinese journalists. It's the first time Biden and Xi have met formally since Biden took office in January. U.S. officials describe the tone of the meeting as respectful and straightforward, and China says the meeting was fruitful. The leaders of the two countries believe that the meeting was candid, constructive, substantive and fruitful. That's what China's foreign ministry said on Tuesday, after a virtual meeting between U.S. President Biden and Chinese Communist Party head Xi Jinping. Their talks on Monday ended with the two leaders agreeing they should tread carefully during a time of particularly high tensions. According to the ministry, China is confident it can maintain its strength, but is open to improving relations with the U.S., while both leaders restated long-standing policy positions on Taiwan and other issues. U.S. officials described the overall tone of the dialogue as respectful and straightforward. President Biden was clear where he believed that certain of the PRC's actions are potentially destabilizing, and he stressed the need to develop ways to manage strategic risk and to put into place common sense guardrails to ensure that competition doesn't veer into conflict. What's more, Taiwan has paid particular attention to the U.S.-China meeting. The Biden administration has repeatedly reiterated that the United States' commitment to Taiwan is rock solid and we will continue to pay close attention to the interaction between the United States and China. At a weekly press conference, Taiwan's Ministry of Foreign Affairs said it will continue to promote its global partnership with the U.S. Despite rising tensions and areas of disagreement, experts see the summit dialogue as sending a positive signal on improving ties. We will see a turning point. We will see uh, uh, you know, the, the continuous uh, deterioration and downward spiral be, be kept at a certain level now. Maybe become a stable, or even come up, up, uplifting a bit of the relationship. But we have to remember that the long-term structural challenges between the United States and China have really yet to be addressed by these two leaders uh, and these two governments in, in any way. In the meantime, the White House has set low expectations for the meeting. No major announcements nor a joint statement were delivered. Coming up, there's going to be a showdown between the NFL and the NBA. Two former players are going to fight each other in the boxing ring. We spoke to them today. And Bostonians enjoyed performances from Shen Yun Performing Arts over the weekend. One audience member said the show allowed him to see what China was like before communism took over. Find out more in just a moment here on NTD News. Nike is postponing the release of its sneaker collaboration with rapper Travis Scott following the Astro World tragedy. Nike made the announcement on its website today, saying the move was a sign of respect for everyone impacted by the Astro World tragedy. Ten people died when crowds started surging when Scott started performing. That includes a nine-year-old boy who died Sunday from his injuries after being trampled at the festival. The sneaker is officially known as the Nike X Travis, Travis Scott Air Max 270 Cactus Trails. It was originally set to be released in December. A rescheduled release date has not been announced. And two professional ball players are changing gears and will fight each other in the boxing ring. One played on the NFL, the other one was in the NBA. NTD's Arian Pazdar has the story. Running back Frank Gore is going to fight point guard Deron Williams. It's the first professional boxing match for both of them, but they say they've been training for quite some time. The main fight of the day will be between Jake Paul and Tom Furry. But this one might be more interesting for the NBA and NFL fans out there. You might think that a running back has better chances in this fight, but that's not necessarily the case. I can't say if I could take more hits than him because I play ball. It's, you know, boxing is a totally different sport. Boxing is not only not a ball sport, but also not a team sport. How are they adjusting to that? In the team sport, you can hide behind other guys. You know, in football, it's 11 on 11. It's kind of like getting thrown into the fire. Um, and having to adjust. Athletes often exchange verbal arguments ahead of competitions, something these two don't seem to like much. 
Okay, didn't hear any trash talk today. How do you see that going forward? I'm not. I'm not a trash talker. So you know, even if he would have came out and talked trash, you're not gonna. You're just not gonna hear it from me. Uh, I respect uh, any man who want to get in the ring. Uh, they gotta have some type of toughness. The two say they won't have any hard feelings for each other after the fight, which will take place on December 18th in Tampa, Florida. Arian Pastar, NTD News, New York. Boston's theater district welcomed Shen Yun last night. The classical Chinese dance company attracted audiences from all walks of life. Let's take a look. Shen Yun's two performances on November 13th and 14th at the historic Bach Theater in Boston were highly anticipated. We love the, the performance, the theater, the music, the dancing, the singing, everything about it. The aesthetic was totally unique, different than anything we'd seen before. The performance is fantastic. And I've heard about it for years, uh, and we finally got a chance to, to come see it. And, um, you know, musicians are fantastic. I thought the message is, is very positive. Um, I've known for a long time that there's sort of a, a controversy uh, in mainland China, and it's unfortunate because uh, the message is very positive. Each year, Shen Yun tours around the world, but cannot perform in mainland China. That's because there are pieces depicting the Chinese regime's ongoing persecution of Falun Gong and other faiths. It's, it's amazing and it's brave that they're doing this, because somewhere in, in this gigantic United States, the China that nobody likes is here wanting to stop this. You know, and thank God they're not. So, because the show is amazing and they, they need to tell their story. Shen Yun has a mission to revive 5,000 years of Chinese culture before the Communist Party destroys it. When I first got the tickets, it's like, we're, we're, we're going to see something about China and, and we don't always like China. But this is so good because it shows what China's all about. It, it's really amazing, yes what the old China is, and it's, it's, it's all beautiful. It's great. Traditional Chinese culture is rooted in spirituality. Shen Yun aims to portray those ancient values on stage through classical Chinese dance. I thought it's really about hope, and it's about, um, you know, finding um, each other and having compassion with each other. And, um, you know, it's expressed in the, in the dance and in the music and in the humor. So it was very enjoyable. Shen Yun will perform in New Jersey next weekend. NTD News, Boston, Massachusetts. Coming up, joining a crowded Democratic primary, New York City public advocate Jamani Williams is running for governor of the state. And kids skip school on Monday to go with their parents to California's state capitol and protest. That and more on NTD News. Secure, the true solution for your digital privacy and security. Secure is a private and secure messaging and email solution hosted in Switzerland using military-grade encryption and Swiss privacy laws, giving you true privacy. Secure is 100% private and does not collect or sell any of your personal data. Secure's Helix technology connects you securely to our Swiss servers without the need of a VPN, guaranteeing privacy and security for all your communications. Secure Messenger doesn't require your phone number or any personal data that hackers target. Chat by Invites allows you to chat privately and securely with anyone outside of your secure network without the need for others to download Secure. Secure Send offers you a private and secure way to email anyone outside of Secure. You won't find this level of privacy or security on any other email or instant messaging application. Visit secure.com. Regain and protect your privacy today. You worked hard for your money. You invest in stability for your retirement and your family's future to build and leave them with something greater. The next unprecedented financial crisis, political misstep or unstable government can depreciate it all away. It was called the gold standard for a reason, the financial preservation of tomorrow. Diversify your assets against inflation, market volatility, and the unknown with real money. Hedge your wealth with the purest form of money, physical gold and silver. Because any currency printed on paper can be manipulated. What's backing up your IRA? Do what you need to do right now to be prepared with the Reagan Gold Group. Visit now rggusakit.com or call us at 866-912-1384.
Receive up to $2,500 in free silver coins and a free safe with your new Precious Metals IRA. Call now. Government watchdog Judicial Watch is warning more than a dozen large counties over their voter roll updates. The organization says the counties removed an absurdly low number of inactive voters. And Judicial Watch says it will file lawsuits if the counties don't act. NTD's Don Ma brings us more. Judicial Watch announced Tuesday that it has issued warnings to election officials in 14 large counties and five states. The organization says the state's own reported data shows that the counties removed an absurdly low or impossible number of inactive voter registrations. Judicial Watch says this is evidence that they are violating the National Voter Registration Act of 1993. The act requires election officials to cancel a voter registration when a voter fails to respond to address confirmation notices and then fails to vote in the next two general federal elections. And states have to report this data to the Federal Election Assistance Commission. Judicial Watch looked at that data from the last four years, from November 2016 through November 2020. For example, Kings County, New York, had over 1.7 million voter registrations in November 2020, but removed only 14 registrations in the past four years. The 14 counties combined have in total over 11 million voter registrations, but they removed only 33 inactive voters in the past four years. The 14 counties are in either California, New York State, or Oregon. Besides these three states, Judicial Watch is warning election officials in Arkansas and Illinois for similar reasons. Robert Popper, a senior attorney for Judicial Watch, says about 10% of Americans move every year. Those counties should generate hundreds of thousands of canceled registrations. Don Ma, NTD News. The already crowded race for New York governor has just gotten more intense as a New York City public advocate announces his run. Jumani Williams is a former city council member and 45-year-old Democrat. In a video on Tuesday, he officially announced his run for governor, touting his activism on immigration and police reform. I've never been one to sit still. When I see injustice or inertia, I move to action. Williams has been arrested several times for civil disobedience at demonstrations for liberal causes. He self-identified as a democratic socialist when he unsuccessfully ran for lieutenant governor in 2018. When I marched to block a deportation, it demonstrated the obligation we have to do what we can to move toward justice. He will take on incumbent Governor Kathy Hochul, who took office after former Governor Andrew Cuomo stepped down over sexual harassment allegations. Also running is State Attorney General Letitia James, whose investigation prompted Cuomo's resignation. Williams promises to challenge the status quo in New York government. It was toxic in even how decisions were made. He said Hochul and James both failed to fix things. The focus on just making sure the status quo, just making sure there's incumbency protection, just making sure the people who can write the biggest checks are the ones in the rooms that makes the policy. Democrat Mayor Bill de Blasio is also considering a run, along with Suffolk County Executive Steve Ballone and Congressman Tom Swasey. On the Republican side, Representative Lee Zeldin, former Westchester County Executive Rob Astorino, and Andrew Giuliani have also launched campaigns. A federal appeals court rules against the National Rifle Association today in a lawsuit the group filed. The NRA sued over then-New York Governor Andrew Cuomo's executive order of March 2020. It included gun stores among the non-essential businesses that had to shut down under the state's pandemic restrictions. The NRA claimed this violated the Second Amendment. The Second U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals in Manhattan ruled against the NRA's bid for an injunction. The court said the request was moot because there was no reasonable prospect of more closures. Cuomo's ex executive order was later rescinded, and New York state lawmakers reduced the governor's power to impose pandemic restrictions. The appeals court also refused to award damages to the NRA. The judges say the NRA lacked standing to sue on its members' behalf and that sovereign immunity under the U.S. Constitution's 11th Amendment barred claims against state officials. 
And a U.S. Congresswoman for California is not running for re-election. She's the latest of at least three other Democrats who have announced they are leaving Congress next year. NTD's Kevin Hogan has more on her long resume, how she survived a massacre, and her reason for retiring. By your support during good times and Longtime U.S. Representative Jackie Speer, currently serving California's 14th district, is retiring from public office. She made the announcement on Twitter Tuesday. It's time for me to come home. Time for me to be more than a weekend wife, mother, and friend. It's been an extraordinary privilege and honor to represent the people of San Mateo County and San Francisco at almost every level of government for nearly four decades. Speer was first elected to the House in 2008. Before that, she served as a state representative and senator. And in 1978, she survived an ambush that preceded the Jonestown Massacre in which over 900 members of an American cult died by suicide at the direction of their leader. 43 years ago this week, I was lying on an airstrip in the jungles of Guyana with five bullet holes in my body. I vowed that if I survived, I would dedicate my life to public service. I lived and I served. It's been a remarkable journey that has surpassed my wildest dreams. She joins three other congressional Democrats who plan to leave office next year. Those are Kentucky's John Yarmuth, David Price of North Carolina, and Mike Doyle serving the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Kevin Hogan, NTD News. On Monday, hundreds gathered at California's capital to protest against the COVID-19 mandates. It's the second round of protests put together by the organization Our Children, Our Choice. In order to understand who we are and why we're here. Hundreds filled the north steps of the state capitol in Sacramento to protest against California's vaccine mandate for kids in kindergarten to the 12th grade. Many kids skipped school to go join the rally. Well, I want to go to Placer, and so, well, the thing is, like, I can't go to Placer because they're saying, like, I have to get the vaccine, and that's just not our thing, you know? And I, we're talking about moving because that's, like, the only choice that we have, and just moving is so scary because Auburn is all I've known for, like, my whole life, and my dream is pretty much to go to Placer, which is kind of dumb. I even miss Spirit Week this t- today. I even miss Pajama Days today. I honestly don't like how they're forcing the vaccine and we and they shouldn't be forcing us the vaccine it's against our rights i don't know we're kids i feel like we shouldn't have to be fighting about those things you know uh, but it, it is important yeah like it's kind of like a talk that happens during like say like lunch time or stuff like that yeah. and honestly it's not really our spot to be talking about that this yeah. is all about freedom for parents to make the choices for their children and that is similar to the mandate because the mandate is basically the government making decisions for the parents in relation to their children. So this is very similar because we're standing for freedom for the parents to make the choices for their own children. In August, the California School Choice Foundation presented an initiative to the Attorney General to create an education savings account for each K-12 student. With it, $14,000 is deposited from the general fund to each student's account. And parents can choose public school, private school, charter school, um, home school, and the funding basically follows the child. So at the end of the year, if the $14,000 isn't used up, it will roll into a fund for the child, and at the age of graduation, they can still use that money for college or trade school, um, and they have availability to it till they're 30 years old. Organizers will need to gather 1 million signatures to put the initiative on the November 2022 ballot. They have another protest scheduled on January 3rd at 1 p.m., also at the Capitol. A California college is trying to help students that need basic services. But some activists have previously said the school hasn't been doing enough. NTD's David Lamb visits one of the campus resource centers. Today is the grand opening of the SJSU CARES office, which provides information and resources for students in need. Now, representatives told us um, they wanted to break uh, the myths and misunderstanding that the program may have. San Jose State University students can get help from the new facility and work with a case manager. According to SJSU staff, case managers help students find long-term plans for financial assistance. There is also a food pantry that students may sign up for. There's a reason that we call it basic needs. Uh, if, 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 you're, if you're food insecure or you're not sure where you're going to be staying, 
How do you concentrate on other kinds of things? Earlier this month, members of the Student Homeless Alliance Shaw rallied on campus, calling for SJSU to make changes to their signed agreement. Activists said that only one out of 12 emergency beds were used during a whole semester. But a CARES office representative told us not all students may want to stay in the beds all semester long. CARES provided 85 days of temporary emergency housing from July to September elsewhere. During the pandemic, the construction was delayed on the office due to few students being on campus. We didn't close our food pantry, so it continued. But the actual construction of this physical space was something we paused such that we could make sure it was ready when students came back, and that's what we've been able to do. The VP said he hopes this allows the school to increase the number of students they help and provides information to help other students. David Lamb, NTD News, California. Finding parking can be difficult when traveling to an airport, so the San Jose International Airport in California introduced an online reservation system to help. Travelers shared their thoughts on the system with NTD's Cynthia Kai. The San Jose International Airport upgraded its parking system to include touchless entry and exit, license plate recognition, and an online parking reservation system. Travelers agree the reservation system can help reduce the stress of finding parking. Parking is just crazy, you know, so it is pretty nice knowing that uh, there's an app to where or a thing you can go to reserve your parking. Located in parking lot one, the reservation system allows people to book and pay online and enter the parking lot by scanning their QR code upon arrival. I would do definitely do that. It would cause less stress, especially today I'm not traveling with my kids, but if I was traveling with my kids, it would be way less stressful and we would know where to go and it would just make the whole experience of traveling much, much easier. Many people welcome the new parking system upgrades especially with COVID, I think, so, so that you uh, reduce the contact with other people. So I think it's great that there is an online system that's for people. SJC Director of Aviation John Atkin said in a statement, Prior to the pandemic, record-breaking passenger traffic sometimes meant difficulty for travelers looking to secure a spot in our parking facilities. Now, as traffic returns, people can arrive with a level of certainty that they have a parking spot awaiting them at the airport. Reservations are available for Economy Parking Lot 1 through 2022, with plans to expand the program to all lots by early next year. Cynthia Kai, NTD News, California. Coming up, extreme pandemic prevention measures in China are sparking outrage online. Footage shows health workers hitting a pet dog while its owner was in quarantine. The dog later died. And in France, a government spokesperson says they may order a new lockdown only for unvaccinated people. But French citizens aren't too pleased with the idea. That more on NTD News. Now we'll look at the latest on China's pandemic control. Security footage related to China's prevention measures sparked outrage on social media. The clip, captured inside a residential home, shows health workers striking a pet corgi while its owner was in quarantine and not at home. The dog was later killed off screen. It's the latest example of extreme measures in the country's pursuit of zero COVID. Will Ripley has more, but just a warning, some viewers may find the following footage disturbing. Even in China, with some of the world's harshest pandemic protocols, what you're about to see crossed a line. Security footage from Southeast China Friday, sparking outrage on Chinese social media, shared by a devastated dog owner. Some viewers may want to look away. COVID prevention workers forced their way into a locked apartment, one with a plastic bag, the other a crowbar. Did the leader say we need to settle it right on the spot, one says? Yes, the other replies, before taking a swing at the head of a small corgi cowering behind a table. The dog whimpers, runs to another room. The workers off camera finish the job absolutely heartbreaking, shocking, and totally brutal. And in your view, completely unnecessary. There is no justifiable reason why this should ever be done to a companion animal. The dog owner in quarantine, no pets allowed. A handful of people in her building tested positive for COVID. She tested negative. 
her dog was never tested. Some Chinese cities like Shanghai allow people to quarantine with their pets. In many places, pet owners are forced to leave their animals behind. A local government statement confirms the corgi was killed as part of a need to thoroughly disinfect homes in the area. The workers safely disposed of the dog, the statement says. They apologized for failing to fully communicate with the owner, both no longer on the job. CNN reached out to the dog owner and authorities. So far, no response. Other pets have died in China's zero COVID crackdown, including these cats in September, killed without their owner's consent. She was in the hospital with the virus. There's no scientific evidence that dogs and cats can spread COVID to humans. There is a risk if an infected person were to touch or handle a cat or a dog, but that would be exactly the same risk as if you were touching a doorknob after an infected person. Less than three months before the Winter Olympics in Beijing, China accused of extreme measures to fight a fresh outbreak. Millions of people under mandatory lockdowns. Just over 1,300 reported cases nationwide. Chinese authorities under tremendous pressure to eliminate the virus. Some call this a heartbreaking example of unchecked government power in the name of public health. And while more and more people are keeping pets in China, there are no laws against animal cruelty there. And over to Europe. After Austria implemented a lockdown on the unvaccinated, France's authorities are considering doing the same as COVID-19 cases surge in the country. But the French people appear to be opposed to that measure. NTD's David Vives has more from Paris. The possibility of another round of lockdowns looms over France, as new COVID-19 cases have surpassed a daily average of 10,000 in the country. Health authorities are suggesting new measures. One of them might be a lockdown for only unvaccinated people. This would follow in the footsteps of Austria, which implemented the measure on Monday. On the same day, a French government spokesperson said that no options are excluded, including forcing the unvaccinated to stay home. But this idea is hard to accept for Parisians. I think this really is nonsense. This really proves that we are right to doubt the vaccine efficacy. As for me, I got the two jabs. I don't want to get the third jab. When we see what's happening in Austria, of course we are afraid the same lockdown will be implemented here. We know that people can't bear it anymore. They were vaccinated more or less against their will, and they thought that was going to be enough. I think it's better if we all stick together and try something else together, rather than split up and have part of the population in lockdown. The Academy of Medicine suggested modifying the health pass into a vaccine pass, which means a negative COVID-19 test would no longer be enough. Unvaccinated residents won't be able to take trains, go to restaurants or even visit the hospital. However, the proposed measures were heavily criticized on social media. The criticism likely prompted the government spokesperson to clarify that no future lockdowns are expected at the moment. Even if there is no plan for new measures yet, there is a possibility of more restrictions for the unvaccinated, following the lead of other European countries. David Vives, NTD News, Paris. British police have identified Ahmed Al Swamin as the man who set off an explosive device in a taxi outside Liverpool Women's Hospital on Sunday. The four men arrested following the blast have been released without charge. Police say they are satisfied with the accounts they provided. The 32-year-old suspect was an asylum seeker from the Middle East who converted from Islam to Christianity several years ago. Greater Manchester police are calling for any information about the man, no matter how small, to assist in their investigations. Police on Monday said they found important evidence at an address he rented, which was also the address where the suspect was picked up by the taxi before arriving at the maternity hospital where the explosion took place. Today, Polish forces are using tear gas and water cannons against migrants attempting to cross into the country from Belarus. Migrants are throwing stones and other objects at Polish forces as they try to get through the border fences. But how did this situation come about? NTD's Lee Hall talks us through the background of this crisis. For weeks, thousands of people from areas of conflict such as Iraq and Syria have flown to the Belarusian capital Minsk and then arrived at the borders of Latvia 
Lithuania and Poland, the three EU countries next to Belarus. This created a migrant crisis and several thousand people now camped to the Polish border. To get an idea of the numbers, well, in the first six months of this year, a thousand people illegally tried to cross from Belarus to Poland. Then, in October alone, 17,000 people tried to get across. EU leaders say Belarus is manoeuvring this crisis in relation to sanctions by the UK and the EU. Sanctions in response to unfair elections that have kept Belarusian leader Alexander Lukashenko in power since 1994. Lukashenko denies creating the migrant crisis, but concrete evidence says otherwise. Videos surfaced of Belarusian forces escorting migrants to the border, and Belarus's national airline has increased the number of flights to Minsk from places like Turkey, Syria and Dubai from 17 per week in 2019 to 40 per week. So far, neither Lukashenko nor Poland shows any signs of backing down. Canadians are finding it harder to pay for their daily necessities. Groceries, gasoline and housing prices are all on the rise. NTD's Don Ma brings us more. According to Statistics Canada, the Consumer Price Index rose by more than 4% this September compared to last September. This marks the highest year-over-year -year increase since 2003. And compared to this August, the index rose 0.4%. Gasoline prices rose the most, almost by 33%. Beef rose more than 13% and chicken rose 10%. I used to buy a bag of apples for three dollars, two ninety nine a dollar, and now it's five ninety nine, and that's a regular price. Everybody's feeling financial pressure, you know, right? You know, money is devaluating. Bank of Canada Governor Tiff Macklem said inflation is temporary. I want to assure you that inflation is not going to stay as high as it is today, even if it's going to take somewhat longer to come down. A recent study published by Angus Reid shows that inflation is weighing heavily on Canadians' minds. Nearly 90% of respondents say that rising costs of living worry them even more than the risk of losing their jobs. It's very hard for a family to, to keep up with all the increased prices when incomes aren't going up, but everything else is around you. <laughs> Some families shop around to save money. They even change shopping habits. I just see what the best price is, and I usually buy in bulk. Well, I've definitely changed uh, how I cook and what I'm buying. I mean, there's definitely uh, less meat. I only buy stuff on sale. Canadian Parliament member Melissa Lanceman wants the government to help reduce inflation. So no more printing money, no more spending money that we don't have on programs that we don't need, and put that money back into people, back into businesses, so that we can get, so that we can get moving again. Meanwhile, Canadians will still have to figure out how to deal with rising commodity prices. Don Ma, NTD News. Hello, I'm Mike Lindell, and I'm here to tell you about my new product from my pillow. Towels that actually work. Watch this absorbency test. Here's another towel that we randomly went out and bought. Here's one of my towels with a nice design. I don't know if you can see this, but you could line a swimming pool with this. This is crazy. Get rid of it. Towels that actually work. The new MyPillow towels are exclusively made with 100% USA combed cotton with proprietary technology and with maximum absorbency. They dry you faster and are guaranteed to work. I'm interrupting this commercial right now. Retailers have canceled MyPillow. And to thank you for all your support, I'm going to pass the savings directly on to you. Go to MyPillow.com to get deep discounts on all MyPillow products. For example, you get my dog beds for as low as $19.99 or for a limited time you can get my six piece towel sets regularly $109.99 now only $39.99 the lowest price ever with your promo code the Dubai air show is underway in the UAE visitors are showing up for spectacular aerial displays while industry giants sign big deals for new aircraft NTD's Andrew Thomas reports. The biennial event opened Sunday, November 14th, as the aviation industry tries to rebound from the pandemic. I think the Dubai Air Show is quite nice. It's the first time for me to come. The previous years, they didn't open it to the general public. 
So this year it's quite nice. I brought my family along. My boys were really excited to see the airplanes. This year, all eyes are on defense and military hardware from countries like Russia and Israel. But there are commercial contracts being signed, too. Airbus has secured a deal to sell 255 new aircraft to Indigo Partners' various low-cost carriers. The package includes a mix of A321neo and A321xlr aircraft. Charlie Duke was the lunar module pilot for the Apollo 16. Even though aerospace technology has made great strides since 1972, his space exploration experience is still fascinating. He addressed the companies attending the show. I've flown up just about everything that all the companies made here, and I, and I got to uh, go to the moon on uh, Apollo uh, uh, 16, uh, made by uh, 400,000 uh, people that were, didn't even know how to do it when it was announced. Airline Emirates is letting visitors get a taste of its new The Game Changer suite. The full-height suite aims to satisfy the high expectations of first-class passengers and comes with a 32-inch television screen and a personal minibar. Welcome on board our new Emirates Game Changer 777. This is a full-class suite. Yeah, so you've got total privacy here. You can close the doors and also close the windows. Like this. The airline industry as a whole is recovering from last year's roughly $138 billion net loss. But the International Air Transport Association still forecasts a net loss of $11.6 billion for airlines in 2022 and nearly $52 billion in losses this year. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. And that's all for today's news. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Stephanie Cox. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.